That was good. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, please, chapter number one. Revelation. I guess you all know by now this is one of my favorite books in the Bible. A lot of churches won't touch Revelation with a 10 foot pole. It's the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing, though. Verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, keep those things which are written therein. The time's at hand. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Notice who it's written to. John, the Apostle John. This is one of the twelve, one of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come that encompasses all aspects of time, past, present, and future, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word now, Lord, as it goes forth, for the purpose that you intended, it will not return into you void, but it will accomplish that which you please. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Bless his righteous, righteous name. Amen. You can be seated. The book of Revelation. There's no other book in the world like the book of Revelation. There are certain books in the New Testament which they called contested books. In other words, the early church was not too quick to to embrace them and to accept them. Certain members, certain people uh, had a problem with them and the book of Revelation is one of them. And it took a while for the church to completely and fully embrace the book of Revelation. I'll tell you why. The book of Revelation is high and lofty and lifted up and speaks of bold sweeping statements about things that are going to happen in the future. The book of Revelation is a powerful, powerful book because the book of Revelation is a kind of a panoramic view all the way from the past, present, and into eternal future. The book of Revelation lifts you up and carries you past the sorrows and sufferings of this world and shows you a world to come. The book of Revelation begins to talk about things in heaven as if they're just right there before your very eyes. And the Apostle John saw these, for he says two times. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And then he talks about Christ as he saw them in his glory. Then he said, I was in the Spirit. And then he said in Revelation chapter number 4, caught up into the third heaven. So the Apostle John was talking about being in the Spirit. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the apocalypse or the apocalypsis. It's the unveiling of the future. But not only that, it is the unveiling of Christ himself. For the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer hanging on a cross. He's certainly not buried in a tomb. But now he's at the right hand of the Father, high and lifted up. As our brother preached to us last Sunday from Philippians 2, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Amen. And hath given him a name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. That he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. I confess him to be Lord this morning. Make no mistake about it. He's the Lord God Almighty. Now you may want to run and hide in a hole somewhere. And not confess that. But you will. The time will come when you will gladly confess that he is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The book of Revelation starts off with him in his glory. A hair white as snow, eyes as a flame of fire. When he speaks to the sound of rushing water and the Bible said his feet as fine brass. He walks in the midst of the churches and if the judgment must first begin at the house of God. So he walks in the midst of the churches of Asia Minor. There are seven of them. Chapters number two and chapters number three of the book of Revelation go into detail as he talks about these churches and has specific messages for them. 
Then we get to the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation and everything begins to change. In the fourth chapter of Revelation, the Bible said, I saw heaven open. And when heaven was, he said it was caught up into heaven. And there's two times that heaven opens in the book of Revelation. It opens to receive John in chapter number four. Then in chapter number 19, it opens again when someone comes down. Chapter number four, someone goes up. Chapter number 19, someone comes down. Chapter number four, John the apostle goes up into the third heaven. John chapter, Revelation chapter number 19, the Lord Jesus Christ comes down out of heaven. So my friend, when heaven opens, something's going to happen. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. And the book of Revelation talks about heaven opening. It's a book that grabs your attention and gets a hold of you. Because in Revelation chapter number 9, not only does heaven open, but hell opens. The Bible says an angel comes down with a key to the bottomless pit. And up from this pit comes a beast. This beast is mentioned again in chapter number 11 and verse number 7. The scripture says that this beast ascended out of the pit and it makes war against the saints. This beast is called a pat, a baton, and a polyon. It is the spirit of Antichrist that comes up from what's down beneath you. Not a whole lot is said about what's beneath you, but there's a world down there beneath you. What's on the surface of this earth is not all that is in this earth. The Bible says that the, that the day is coming when all that are in the heavens and on the earth and under the earth shall declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a world underneath where you're walking right now. So from beneath this world that I'm standing on, a creature comes up. And this creature, the spirit of Antichrist, in Revelation chapter number 13, verse 1, it tells me where it comes up. And it says he comes up from the great sea. That sea is the sea of, of, uh, of uh, the Mediterranean. It is the great sea in Scripture. And it is in that area that the Antichrist will rise. A lot of people do not believe that there's such a thing as an Antichrist. But I'm telling you right now, I believe he's alive. I believe he's walking on this earth. I believe at this very moment he's living and breathing right here on planet earth. I don't think most people realize how close we are to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At any moment he could appear. But it is said that beneath your feet, it is said that beneath your feet, there is a shadow world, a world that controls the government that passes from one government to the next. That this shadow world is a collusion between the power that is voted into office and the demonic forces that reside there from generation to generation. This world, they say, that is underneath us is a world where the demons are actively engaged in preparing and building what they intend to bring upon the, upon the face of the earth when they will deceive mankind. I'm not saying I believe this, but I'm saying there seems to be a possibility. Think about this for a moment. Thousands of people have seen UFOs. Thousands and thousands have seen them. Have you ever seen one sitting on the ground? Can anybody produce to me one single UFO that the skies apparently at times were full of? Thousands of people say that they have seen Bigfoot. Thousands of them swear on their deathbed that they have seen Bigfoot. But nobody can produce one single body of a Bigfoot on this earth. Yet these people, you cannot deny that they have seen something. You cannot deny the reality of what they believe to be reality. Now I want you to think with me this morning. If one passed before the Lord Jesus Christ and said, I show you the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He said, all of this is in my power. I can give it to whomsoever I will. That was not an idle boast. If he has the power to show the Lord Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, surely he has the power to bring about manifestations in the skies and walking on the earth. And yet nobody can produce a body of Bigfoot. Nobody can produce a UFO. Yet there are people today that will swear and pass lie detector tests that they have seen both of these things. They're real, but they're not real like you're real. 
They belong to the spirit world and the world of deception. Oh yes, they're out there. And there's a whole lot more than simply these things. There's an awful lot of stuff happening today. Where's it coming from? There are those who say that beneath your feet is a shadow world. And that shadow world is inhabited by demons that are preparing for the great deception that's coming on this earth. It is said that JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was told about this shadow world and that he in turn was going to make it public to the world, that he would no longer allow the cover-up to continue. Do you know what happened to him? They blew his head off in Dallas, Texas. Now you say, do you believe that, preacher? I'm saying it's plausible. I'm saying that there's a lot of things out there that I consider, whether I subscribe to it or not, I consider it, and I read about it, and I pray about it, and I think you should read about it, and you should pray about it, and you should read Revelation chapter number 13. For in Revelation 13, there is coming on this earth something that will literally take the hearts and minds of mankind. In 1987, they met out there and all, they met in different places on the earth in what's called a harmonic convergence. This harmonic convergence was so that they could get together during the time of the alignment of the planets, which is supposed to be a powerful spiritual time, and they were going to meditate at one time all over the earth. What were they meditating for, preacher? They were meditating for the coming of peace and the coming of a new age of peace down to planet earth. You say, preacher, did they bring the age of peace? Peace is not going to come until the Prince of Peace comes. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can bring peace. But these people are deadly serious. Sedona, Arizona is one spiritual hotspot. Dulce, New Mexico is another spiritual hotspot. Mount Shaska in Washington is another spiritual hotspot. These are called vortexes. These are places where you can go plug in to some spiritual power. Well, you say, preacher, this is, these are just simply crazy new age people that are just crazy. And I don't have to worry. Let me tell you something. The day is going to come, and I think it's here right now, that the mass of humanity are so deluded and so full of the spirit of this world and the spirit of hell that they're ready to receive anything it comes down the pike. It will be a, a harmonic convergence. It will be that their minds and their hearts and their spirits and their soul are all together because when the Antichrist steps out on the stage of time, he will deceive this whole world. And not only that, but 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 says that God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie and be damned who loved not the truth but loved unrighteousness. Delusion is coming. The only way you can know you have the truth is open that Bible in your lap. <coughs> Pray over that scripture you have in your hand. Get on your knees and ask God to give you wisdom and to spare you to discern the spirits of this age. I hate to say this this morning, but most of the churches that you go in in this country and around the world is not a church of God. It's a gate to hell. Most of the churches are not preaching the truth. They're preaching a modified New Age doctrine, a watered down cross, a watered down gospel, and you can't get saved in a place like that. You must be born again. And the Word of God is the only way that you can be born of the Spirit of the living God. Aren't you glad today that you have the truth? Aren't you glad the Holy Ghost lives in your soul? Aren't you glad that you know that something out there is about to happen? It is, friend. We're a lot closer than people think. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was, was, was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, supposedly by Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald, when I checked into his record, his last, his, he qualified twice with a rifle. And the, the second time he qualified, he qualified as a marksman. That's barely qualifying. In the Marine Corps, if you don't qualify with a rifle, you're out. You've got to qualify every year with that weapon. And he barely made it as a marksman. And yet he's supposed to hit a moving target that looks about that big through that scope. And I don't know how far it was from him, but he was not qualified to do that. It would have taken a Carlos Hathcock to be able to shoot that man's head. How many of you know who that is? That's one of the greatest marksmen that ever lived. It would have taken an expert like him to be able to drop that man in that car, not Lee Harvey Oswald. I believe there's a whole lot more 
to the death of John F. Kennedy than Lee Harvey Oswald. I believe there is something going on underneath our feet. If Revelation chapter number 9 is true, there's something coming up from the bottomless pit. So many people, they're so rational and so physical and so material in their thinking. When I preach like this to people, they think, oh, you're crazy, preacher. Let me tell you something, folks. I used to be a devil, but God saved me. I used to be a child of hell, but God changed me. I'm not what I used to be. How did that happen? It happened because the Holy Ghost moved inside my soul and changed me from what I was and to who I am today. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Get ready, folks. These people have the same spirit. The two that carried that sign up there and said, if Mary had had an abortion, we wouldn't be in this mess. That's the spirit of hell I'm talking about. There is no dialogue with these people. These people are your enemy. And if you can't see that, you're dead wrong. There was a time in the past when you might be able to sit down and work out some problems. Somebody said America is divided. It's divided like you wouldn't believe. There is a division in this country that is unbelievable. There is one side or the other side. Which side are you on? Which side do you belong to today? Do you belong to that side, that crowd, the baby-killing crowd? Or do you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? He's coming for his bride and he's going to catch us up to meet him in the clouds. Oh, yes, the book of Revelation talks more about angels than any book in the Bible. Far more. Angels play a prominent role in the book of Revelation. Angels carry a message of Revelation to John. Angels represent the seven churches of Asia Minor. Angels call for the, for the, for the worthy one to open the book. Angels hold the four winds of the earth. Angels blow the seven trumpets. Angels stand, one with one foot on earth, and one with one foot on the sea. And he lifts his hand toward heaven. And he swears by him that liveth forever and ever. Yeah. Time is no more. Yeah. An angel fights in the war in heaven. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. Are we getting something? Are we finding out how spiritual the book of Revelation is? And are we finding out how spiritual the end times are? You live in a very spiritual age. Very spiritual age. Everybody is worried so much about superficial things. He offended me. I didn't feel good about this. You're killing babies on one hand, and I'm supposed to care how you feel? You see how warped we are. We're crazy. We're crazy. Crazy. People can't even think straight anymore. Blood is flowing in this country, and I'm supposed to care how you feel? Amen. Amen. <laughs> you uh, feel bad. You offend me. I don't care if you're offended. The Bible offends me every time I open it. And so I get on my face and get right with God. And once I get right, it quit offending me. Amen. There's something good about talking straight. Somebody, yeah, amen, amen. Don't say, don't say too much, I get in trouble. An angel preaches the everlasting gospel. An angel reaps the harvest of heaven. And angels pour out the vials of the wrath of God. Angels are at the gates of the New Jerusalem. They're all over the thing. Angels know, my friend, when you begin to read the book of Revelation, here we got angels showing up like they haven't showed up all through the Bible. Or they're all over the Bible, but they're concentrated here. It's almost as if God does nothing without an angel being involved in it. Amen. The book of Revelation is a spiritual book. Maybe that's why people don't like it. It's too spiritual for them. The seas are turning to blood in the book of Revelation. The stars of heaven are falling to the earth. The grass is burned up. The fountains of water are turned to blood. And the Bible says that there comes a time on this earth when men will seek death and death will flee from them. Heaven and hell are set apart. 
In other words, in contradistinction. In other words, heaven is opened clearly and so is hell. The joys of heaven on one hand and the suffering and sorrow of hell on the other. The book of Revelation not only talks about hell, it talks about a lake of fire and brimstone. It talks about a great white throne and it talks about the seat of Satan. The word translated seat in Revelation 13 is the same word translated throne later on in the book of Revelation. Plain of words, the devil has his throne and Christ has his throne. Satan is sitting on his throne right now. This is all the rule Satan will ever have. This is the only power he'll ever know. He is condemned to the pit and he knows that one day that hell will open and he will go there because of his rebellion against God. The book of Revelation talks about a new Jerusalem and an earthly Jerusalem. Amen. We were studying this past Wednesday night here about that new Jerusalem and Paul said in the book of Galatians he says the new Jerusalem or the Jerusalem which is above is free and it's the mother of us all it is the spiritual union of Christ and his bride that will bring forth all in the future amen that second man last Adam is the one that gives you life that first man first Adam can only give you death aren't you glad you know that last Adam hallelujah yes he can give you life Life more abundantly, that life starts with the, with, the, with the assurance of the Holy Ghost that you're born again. There's something burning in my soul. Amen. There's a fire in my heart, and it came from God. It doesn't need outward stimulus. I don't need a thing this world has. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the truth, the longer I live, the more I am absolutely disgusted with what they call music out there. It's nothing but noise. I love to come into the house of God and hear what Janice is saying a minute ago. Wasn't that beautiful? Wasn't that beautiful? That's that good stuff. Amen. And boy, well, listen, Jerry, I don't know if you could tell it, but at the very moment, there was a moment when the power of God came in here. You could feel the Holy Ghost move to this place. Amen. Some of you don't have a clue, but those of you who know, you know. Do you have an ear? Let him hear. Amen. And it wasn't, it was not, it was not worked up. It was just power. And all of a sudden he showed up. That's the earnest of the Spirit. That's the promise from God. The promise from God said you got a little bit here. It's going to be forever there. Amen. Amen. The book of Revelation talks about a new Jerusalem and an earthly Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, that earthly Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt. My, what a thing. But it makes clear to you who it is because it says where our Lord was crucified. So there's no doubt in anyone's mind that this Jerusalem is talking about the earthly Jerusalem. This Bible makes a distinction between the throne of Antichrist and the throne of Christ, and it makes a distinction between the saved and the lost. The book of Revelation talks about a new Jerusalem, and it talks about those that are inside, those that are outside. It talks about those that are saved, those that are lost, you fit into one of the two categories. You're either saved or you're lost. You either know him or you don't know him. I'm not interested in whether you're a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, or what. I want to know if you know him. The book of Revelation is a beautiful thing when you get to chapter 21 and verse 1. John said, I know I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now watch this. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. How long he has waited for that. How long with anticipation the Almighty has waited for he'll come down and say, Now I'm with you. Now I'm with you. Amen. Now I'm with you. Ever since Adam was separated from him in the garden, it's been God that has taken the initiative and the great plan of redemption has worked its way through the Bible until we come to the point where God said, now he doesn't cry, Adam, Adam, where art thou? It is no longer Adam, Adam, where art thou? It is God putting his arms around Adam and said, now let's walk through the, through, down through the road of the street of life. When men are with God and God is with men, that's why you were made. 
You weren't made to scratch and claw and steal and climb and kill and mangle down on this earth to try to survive. You were made for the glory of God. Amen. That one day he would enjoy you. Amen. Notice what he says. And he's with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. He said, Behold, I make all things new. Write these words, for they are true and faithful. It is done, he said, I'm Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end I will give unto him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life freely. Do you thirst for that water? Oh, my. Let me tell you something that just happened to me a couple of days ago. I was reading my mail. And there's a man out in Las Vegas, and I don't know if he's watching this, if he'll hear it, maybe hear it later. He said his wife was in a car wreck. Wasn't bad. Wasn't bad at all. The, the police officer showed up, and he said, you can go on to work. And so his wife went to work. And he kissed her as she went to work. She got to work, and she bled to death. She had a broken rib that punched a hole in her heart. And she bled to death at work. So that last kiss with his precious sweetheart was the last kiss that he'd ever have on this earth with her. Last time. She said, oh, preacher. He said, we've got to be thinking about where we're going and about how that we could be separated at any moment and that you'd never see that loved one again here on this earth. And I tried my best to comfort him. I wrote him a letter back and quoted scripture and tried to, I did some research and give him some things that might comfort him. Hopefully it was a help to him, but you know something? That is so true. Look at that loved one sitting next to you. Look at that son, that daughter, that husband, that wife. Did you get up mad at each other today? Then before the sun goes down tonight, you should be kissing each other. Amen. You should be hugging. You should be thanking God for that precious life that you have because that life could be stuffed out, snuffed out in a moment. So quickly it happens. I remember a few years ago a young lady that lived that went to Temple and Powell. She was in a car wreck. And she called her mom and said, Mom, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm shook up a little bit, but I'm okay. I'm okay. And so apparently the parents were satisfied and and uh, they took her to the hospital to check her out. She bled to death. Her spleen had been ruptured. And she was bleeding internally and had no idea. And this young, precious girl, young woman, went out into eternity. And so the last thing that that mother has in this world of her daughter is her voice on the phone saying, I'll be okay, Mom. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Don't live for tomorrow. Don't even live for this evening. You better take that one that you love this morning and embrace them and kiss them and hold them and tell them you love them because the next time you see them, it may be when you're caught up. And there is a place up there somewhere, and I don't know where it is. But there is a place up there in God's glory that's just a reunion hall. It's just for the saints of God to see that wife or that husband or that son or that daughter again or that mom or that dad. It's a reunion hall. And all of them gathered around you are going to be doing the same thing. It's a reunion day. That's when you realize the glory of God and the victory that was won at the cross. That's when you realize the power of God to restore, to raise the dead, where there's no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. No more of it. It's gone. No place for it in heaven. You're there with God Almighty. He's the giver of life. Oh, what a day that'll be. My, what a day that'll be. You atheists and agnostics out there and you're condescending smuggery and you look down upon it. What do you got to offer? Yeah, that's it. Tell me now. Go ahead. Tell me what you got to offer. You got nothing. You got nothing but death hanging on you. You breathe death. You talk death. You live in death. That's the only world you know is death. Let me tell you about a world of life. The living one. He said, I am he that liveth. I'm the living one. The living one. He said, because I live, you shall live also. Oh, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he was buried. And I believe he rose again the third day. Yes, sir, I believe that. 
And I believe he's coming again the next time. And he's coming to take us to himself. And I believe there's a heaven and I believe there's a new Jerusalem. And I believe one day I'm going to walk down streets of pure transparent gold. I'm going to look at gates of pearl and walls of jasper. But my friend, that's all nothing. I'm going to see him as he is. I'm going to find me a place. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I know there's going to be millions, but I'm going to get as close as I can and get right next to that throne and fall on my face. And I'm going to say, thank you. 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 So I should have been in hell, but I'm going to be in heaven. I want to get there and thank him. Amen. 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 Say, you're crazy, preacher. I may be, but I'm happy. <laughs> Don't take it away from me. Brother, I believe everything I said to you. You better believe I do. I believe it. And I know what God did for me when he changed me. And that wasn't a joke, and that wasn't temporary. That was eternal. 1973. A couple of days ago, a woman named Norma McCorvey passed away. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I think the date is 1973 that the Supreme Court passed Roe versus Wade. And that's when the slaughter started. That's when the slaughter started. It's been now that you get different figures. Some figures, somebody will give you 55 million, somebody will say 65 million, somewhere in there. 50 to 60 or more million babies have been slaughtered in this country as a product of Roe versus Wade. God help those black robed lawyers that one day they're going to give an account to that almighty being. They're going to stand with blood on their hands. I'm not their judge. He is. Ain't nothing going to change that. They're going to stand and give an account for the murder of all these babies in those years. But Norman McCorvey was the, uh, was the, uh, was the uh, uh, Roe, wasn't it? Well, I think she was Roe, but anyway, she was... Well, you know what happened to her, don't you? She changed her tune. She changed, I don't know what happened. She changed her tune. Good for her. God bless her. She just passed away from heart disease, from uh, 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 artery, coronary artery disease, heart failure, 69 years old. And she's gone now. But she changed from what she used to be. And she didn't get that change from this dying hell hole. She got it from somewhere greater than this place. Amen. Have you ever changed? You ever changed? If you've never changed, you don't know him yet. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's a change that's going to take place. Yes, sir. And all things are new. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I delivered my soul. I pray for him. Pray for every soul, Lord. I know your word's going to do what you want to do with it. I know, you, I know that, Lord. I know that. There's some folk in here today, Heavenly Father. I think some of them are just as, they just, they just don't have a clue, Lord. They're just uh, dumbfounded. They don't know what's going on. I pray for them. I pray for them in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, we ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.